Good evening, everybody. So thanks for that introduction, Nick, and thanks very much for having us here to talk to you today. It is really good to see everybody here in person after what is a two-year break, I guess. So I'm going to take you through um, some of the stuff we've been doing recently in NR60 Mark II, looking at uh, higher speed SNC uh, in the, the more domestic scene. And then after a little bit, Andy's going to take over and look at what we're doing uh, a bit further out, so higher speed <coughs> SNC, um, more kind of linked with what we're doing with, with high speed 2 and the interfaces there. Um, aware it's the end of the day, aware you all want to get home. So before we do that, I'm going to wake you all up. Can I get everyone to stand up? Thank you very much. Right, okay, so a bit of a gauge the audience here now. Can you sit down if you have been actively involved with any Mark II NR60 development in the last couple of years? That's development, drawings, approvals, funding, anything that's NR60 Mark II. Yes, you can. You signed all those drawings off, John. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, here's the moment of truth. Can you sit down if you've heard of NR60 Mark II? That's better. Good. <laughs> All right, so just trying to get a, an idea of what you know and what I need to tell you. Everyone else can sit down. Good. So, story so far, NR60 Mark II is our uh, high-category, high-tonnage SNC system. Uh, it's based on the Sen60 rail, rail section, uh, and it's the first major development in SNC uh, in the last sort of 15, 20 years. Um, not since the last uh, iteration of NR60 Mark I have we done something of this scale. Uh, so this has been developed uh, over the last uh, sort of four or five years. Uh, we trialled it, uh, developed it and trialled it back in sort of 16, 17, uh, and did the first installation up at Thirsk North Junction back in 2017 it was. Uh, we've now installed 50 point ends to date, so it is becoming BAU. It's still obviously news to some people, uh, but it's becoming more and more established and more and more uh, accepted as part of our SNC arsenal, I suppose. This is the good bit. No attributable service affecting failures at all to date, touch wood. So, by my maths, that means an infinite mean time between failure, which is pretty good news. <laughs> so, I mean, there's only one way down from there, isn't there? So, what do we do next? Obviously, we, we put Thirsk in back in um, 2017. Uh, we put our feet up for a bit, uh, but then we realised we needed to get this to, to be a U status. So the good people at um, Track Capital Development funded the initial program. Uh, they gave us two million quid to do the development of the um, turnouts, crossovers, uh, two or three geometries um, per switch size. Uh, so quite a, a restricted um, catalogue of designs uh, to go into the standard design catalogue. Um, what was holding us back at the time uh, was 2102, everyone's favourite track standard, which, if anyone can recall, uh, the previous issue uh, and had been a temporary situation, and that's the one I want to uh, iterate, a temporary situation for the last 10 years uh, allowed us to put in SEN56 SNC in our highest category routes. Um, and that, was, that wasn't a good thing, really, was it? Uh, rail track were putting in SEN60, or uh, aspiring to put in SEN60 in categories two and three way back in, in the mid-noughties. Um, we stepped back when we realised we had some issues with Mark 1, and we got to this situation where this temporary situation, a uh, 56V and the high category stuff, was accepted as normal um, and was BAU. Clearly, that's not where we want to be. So, spot the difference. We finally got round to updating 2102, and now NR60 Mark 1 or Mark 2, we're not fussed, uh, is the, the BAU now for Cat 1 and 1A, which is a really good place to be. So, good job, Andrew McNaughton's not here because he'd tell me that the standards are useless and no one follows them. But that's really good. That's a big success story for us. So, what do we do next? We've done turnouts and crossovers. Uh, they're in the SDC. Uh, people are starting to use them, which is really good news. Um, we've not yet looked at double junctions. So, in order to make Mark II a, a real success and to get SEN60 SNC more widely used, we've got to look at the, the double junctions. Uh, we've got to ask a thorny question of what do we do with the fixed diamonds and the switch diamonds in that range. So, Turn the clock back a few years. Um, Send 60 diamonds. We've got a few in the standard design catalogue in NR60 Mark I, uh, but we haven't got any switch diamonds. They were out of scope of the original Mark I development. Does anyone know why? Uh, I'm hoping you're all going to answer the same question as me, in that the, the early aspirations for Send 60 SNC were to, uh, to open out junctions, so to split out the, uh, the double junction element into a turnout uh, and a crossover 
to allow us to standardize the design catalog, uh, to do away with this uh, perception of unreliable uh, diamonds, both fixed and switch, uh, which is a great idea in theory. Um, opening out junctions in theory is a good idea, but not always pragmatic, not always practical. So just a quick example there, hopefully not teaching anyone to suck eggs. You open out a crossover uh, and a turnout is going to take up more space than um, a conventional double junction. So where space constraints allow, great, let's open it out. But where, where we've got constraints either financially or, um, or on space envelope, uh, I think the, the double junction element is always going to be part of the arsenal. So fixed diamonds first. Relatively straightforward, he says. We, we chose some of the tightest constrained um, layouts to do our pilots for the fixed diamonds uh, at Balham and Falcon Junctions. Um, but using fixed obtuse crossings, uh, we use the same principles we developed through the Mark II um, development program. So changes to internal structure of the crossings. We did some modeling with Huddersfield University looking at the, uh, the topping, uh, the wheel rail transfer zone. Uh, and otherwise, we used sort of standard Sen60 Mark II principles. Uh, that gets us up to sort of D switch length. Um, beyond that, we need a switch diamond. Uh, otherwise, we're going to be constrained on capacity. We're going to be looking at 56 um, solutions uh, in otherwise Sen60 areas, which is, is really not a good thing. So here's the myth or the, the challenge that we've got to work with. Switch diamonds are unreliable. Is it a myth? No, it's not. So our mean time between failure um, for switch diamonds at the moment is hovering around 6 to 12 months, depending on the POE type, which at least it's a low bar for us to aim for, I suppose. It's something we can definitely fix, uh, and, and that's been the key challenge, really, for us, is to move forward with that. We think it's a European first of type. Um, we were quite surprised when we discovered this. Uh, we started looking at Sen60 switch diamonds, um, and we couldn't find them anywhere else in Europe. So, obviously, Sen60 to fit with the, the Mark II philosophy. Uh, shallow depth, again, controversial. I think some of our early, um, Sen6, uh, sorry, our early shallow depth diamonds uh, were not particularly reliable. We'll come on to that in a minute. Uh, otherwise, sharing principles as per NR60 Mark II, uh, and really trying to counter this uh, thermal reliability challenge. Switch diamonds like to move around, um, and that's the biggest problem we've got with diamonds, and that's the biggest challenge we've had to resolve. So if you'll excuse the slightly shonky animation, here's a switch diamond, and here it is uh, on a cold day, and as it cools down, the rails contract, uh, the knuckle gets pinched, uh, and the geometry goes out. Uh, alongside that, you've also got the POE detection, um, which is moving around, uh, and generally speaking, that's what causes our reliability issues. Go the other way, and again, rails warm up, Knuckles get squeezed, geometry goes out, reliability goes down. Uh, so why does that happen, and why does it happen more on, on diamonds than on plain leads and, and crossovers? Um, well, if you look at this photo here, this, uh, this drawing, wherever I've put a, a red arrow, that bed is compromised. So we have got stretcher bars uh, in the two beds adjacent to the knuckle. We've got a very narrow spacing between the two knuckle bearers, and then we've got stretcher bars to the right side of the knuckle as well. So those are four, five beds where we can't damp, we can't fill up with ballast, and therefore we can't really expect it to stay in one place. How do we, uh, how do we expect the SNC to be reliable um, and thermally resilient uh, when, we're doing, when we're doing that? And when we're also machining out half the stock rail foot to enable to, us to have uh, full depth switches uh, at that knuckle area. When you look at it like that, it's just a, a recipe for failure. Um, so that was, that was the, the kind of starting point, what we needed to resolve. So the Mark II diamond, um, plenty of people will tell you what's wrong with diamonds, which is really good news because those are the people we needed to download um, for this piece of work. Uh, so we took a, a workshopping approach with all of our uh, maintenance engineers, uh, the, the most vocal ones, um, particularly around this part of the world, um, will tell you all about their uh, legacy of woes with switch diamonds, uh, and they are the people who we, we really value because they can tell us what's wrong, we can fix it. We looked through sort of common failure modes, so the thermal stuff, uh, and we looked at shallow depth versus full depth. Um, we've got a bit of a history of both on the switch diamond front, um, and we really tried to unpick why the, the shallow depths are perceived as, as unreliable. Uh, alongside that, we had to look at POE reliability, so those figures I showed you earlier um, around um, mean time between failure. We, we know that the RCPL performs better than the HW, 
but it still requires us to empty out all the ballast from the beds around the knuckle. So I don't think that's necessarily the way we want to go. So our detailed design was all about reliability. It's about thermal resilience. Uh, it's about maintaining both the geometry when it heats up and cools down, but also the PoE detection, and that's where the failures tend to happen because the PoE moves around as the switches uh, heat up and cool down. We also wanted to improve impact loading, so rail vehicle interfaces uh, and the rail wear as well. We wanted to get all the PoE either on or in the bearer to get rid of this issue where we've got uh, beds um, devoid of ballast. Uh, and we wanted uh, full section stock rails, so none of that machined foot that I showed you earlier where we, where we lose uh, knuckle stiffness. Mm -hmm. And the other thing to bear in mind as well is that this is a Sen60 system, so a lot of the benefits we get are purely from the fact that it is Sen60. More bearers per uh, 60 foot, as it were, uh, stiffer rail section, uh, taller rail section, better wear properties, so in a way, half our work is, is already done. Um, this has been my, uh, my summer holiday this year uh, in sunny Nottinghamshire, uh, playing with the, the prototype switch diamond panel. Uh, we've put it through its paces, we've really tried to break it. Um, we've simulated thermal forces, so we've, we've moved the switch rails longitudinally up and down uh, to simulate them expanding and contracting in, in varying weather conditions, uh, and we've discovered this, um, this way of setting up the PoE that will allow us to, uh, to, comp to compensate for that. Um, so some of the features we've got, a lot of it is around a more robust system, so full depth strap rails. Um, where's my laser? So full depth strap rails run the length of the knuckle. Um, we've got uh, reinforcement blocks between switch and stock. Uh, we've got the, the standard NR60 Mark II fastening system, so high toe load clips. Uh, we've got a uh, more robust knuckle mounting system, so this is the knuckle bearer. Uh, we've got fish fit um, brackets going into the, uh, the web of the rail there, uh, as well as being bolted through, so we're not just relying on, on, on clips to hold that tow load. And then this is our, um, our POE system that is mechanically completely decoupled from the switch rail bracket. So it floats in this slot, meaning that uh, as the switch rails uh, stretch and, and shrink in, in the cold weather and the hot weather, uh, that doesn't affect the PoE reliability. Um, so, yeah, a whole, whole range of things, but just picked out some of the, the big benefits we're doing there. <coughs> so, what's next? Um, next is to stick it in the ground and see if it works. So, Odington Junction, um, up on the outskirts of Glasgow, uh, West Coast Main Line. So, this is classic NR60 Mark II territory, uh, but without the diamond, it would have been looking at a, um, an island of 756 um, diamond to go with the rest of the route and the rest of the junction, which was Sen60, which clearly didn't make sense. Uh, and that's why the route have funded us to do this development work. Uh, it is 100% life expired. Um, to coin a phrase, the Scottish guys refer to it as hanging out of its, um, you know what I mean? So, uh, so yeah, we do need to do something with this and we need to do something Sen60 with this. Um, it's a challenging environment, uh, not just being in Scotland, but the thermal environment. It's, uh, it's sat in a, a cutting uh, with an overbridge directly over the diamond just there. Uh, so we know it's going to get hot in summer, we know it's going to get very cold in the winter, and it's also going to see quite a lot of uh, fluctuations through the course of the day, just with the way the, uh, the shadow falls on it. Uh, so that's going in at Christmas. Um, we've got a lot of approval work to do between now and then. Uh, so I'm looking after all of the CSM delivery, so common safety method assessment for that, uh, that novel diamond system, uh, alongside the novel POE system as well. <coughs> Uh, we're doing some training for all the guys up there, both on the PoE system and the, the kind of novel aspects of the diamond. Uh, and yeah, it's not just the diamond, it's the rest of the layout design. So this is a, a H-switch with, um, with three novel crossing angles as well. Uh, so that's all ramping up to, to Christmas install. Um, next for us is to try and extend the range of these. Obviously switch diamonds are not that common. We don't put that many in um, over the course of a year. So we'll be looking to, uh, to extend that range, but also we need to find volunteers to, to take them on as, um, as renewals. Uh, helpfully, we've got Ravensthorpe on the horizon, uh, and we're considering putting that in as part of TRU. Uh, we've gone from one extreme to the other, so Uddingston is a 1 in 21, Ravensthorpe's a 1 in 8, and there's a question there about maybe whether that is a, a different design, same design, does one size fit all, uh, still TBC, I think, on that front. What we want to get to is a situation where people don't, run a mile from a switch diamond. So can we get a reliable switch diamond that people want? Rather than in recent years, people have been moving from switch to fixed where they have the option. Um, but can we get them to go the other way? Because with the switch diamond, you've got 
continuous rail support. You've got lower impact forces uh, in perturbed working. You know, you can clip scotch out of use and still run, um, run traffic in one direction, if not the other. Whereas with a, a fixed diamond, you know, you get a broken crossing, that's the junction out of use. So I think there are big benefits on switch diamonds, but we need to answer that reliability question. <clears throat> we need to answer that reliability question and prove that what we're doing is a set purpose. Um, that's me. I've rattled through that quite quickly, I'm aware, but I know Andy's got a fair few things to talk to you about higher speed S&C. So I'll hand over at that point. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Matt. Good afternoon, all. I'll be finishing off the presentation, uh, talking through the next phase of what we're looking to do with NR60 Mark II. So Matt's been going through what we've been doing over the last couple of years, looking at um, higher speeds like at Uddingston and also some of the more complex SNC like the switch diamonds he's been talking about. But I want to now talk about what we're going to be doing in the near future, and that's going to be a particular focus on how we're going to increase the speed of what SNC we've got to support some of our up and coming projects. So if you take a look at our current suite of S&C designs, um, we've got three principal designs. Matt's alluded to them um, a bit earlier on. We've got NR60 Mark I, which used to be a, a derivation of RT60, if you've heard of that. NR60 Mark II, which Matt's been talking about. And then the old vertical 56V design. And on the right there, you can see what our maximum turnout speeds are for, for each of those designs. And you can see we only go up to 90 miles an hour. You might be saying, hold on, Andrew, you're talking rubbish. We've definitely got S&C that we can uh, turn out at more than 100 miles an hour. We've deployed that everywhere before. And that's what the little brackets are on the NR60 Mark I. We did previously install this S&C at 100 miles an hour. So let's just have a look at the uh, history of high-speed S&C in the UK. And before I upset anyone, um, I know this is only showing England, but it just turns out that all of our high-speed S&C has been installed in England in the past. I'm not removing any other countries of the UK. So uh, first of all, look at the orange points, we can see what high-speed turnouts we've installed, which are 100 miles an hour plus. Uh, so we've got some examples there, like at Weaver Junction, which was mentioned earlier in the, uh, the presentation about crew, uh, Rugby Trent Valley Junction, um, and other places like Searchlight Lane and Colton Junction. Swing nose crossings are also a really important part of high-speed s and I'm not going to talk about them much today, but it's important to note that we have used them before on the classic infrastructure at places like Bourne End, Leadburn, an airport junction. Finally, HS1 uh, has already used high-speed S&C with turnouts going up to 140 miles an hour on their route in the southeast. Um, but on network rail, we've not yet achieved those speeds. Network rail, classic infrastructure, we've not achieved those speeds. The reason, uh, uh, sorry. Before I want to talk about why we aren't achieving 100 mile an hour turnouts anymore, we used to, I need to go through a bit of a fundamental session on geometry. So first of all, let me introduce the concept of a vehicle traversing a curve. Most people probably get the concept that as you go around a curve, the vehicle undergoes lateral acceleration to one side. We can compensate this by inclining the vehicle, reducing some of the lateral component and transferring it into a vertical component from the perspective of the vehicle. This is Kant. We probably all are aware of this. If we incline the track enough, all of the lateral component for a given speed is transferred vertically in the reference plane of the vehicle. This is equilibrium Kant. The difference between the two is known as Kant efficiency or uncompensated lateral acceleration. When entering a curve, there's a transition period where the vehicle moves from a Kant efficiency of zero to non-zero. The rate at which this has occurred is the rate of change of Kant efficiency or to coin a technical term, jerk. It doesn't sound technical, but that is the real term. And jerk is a really important factor in the level of comfort passengers feel when traversing curves. An analogy that I like to talk about when I try and explain this to people is imagine driving a car. Most people probably drive a car. If you're entering a curve um, in the road at a given speed, we can equate the Kant deficiency to how far we're turning the wheel to one side. So we go to uh, turn the wheel 90 degrees, go around a curve, um, and we get a force being pushed outside of the vehicle as the experience of a passenger. The rate at which we turn that wheel to enter the curve is how quickly we move from that sideward facing force. And it's traditionally what we feel is discomfort when we're going around turns. And that's what we equate to as jerk in a railway perspective. And that's really important when we understand how uh, passenger comfort comes into play when we talk about high speed turnouts. 
So what happens in S and C? Well, on the assumption that a turnout is simply where a circular curve meets straight track with no cant applied, we move from a point with zero cant deficiency to a point with non-zero cant deficiency instantaneously. So the little graph there is a quick representation of what cant deficiency is like when we enter some, a turnout, and we get an immediately straight line going from non -zero, uh, zero to non-zero. This might appear to show that the rate of change of cant deficiency is infinite at this point, but we know that's not the case. What really happens is when the vehicle traverses that S and C, it's going over at two points, the bogies of the vehicle. This has the effect of inducing a virtual transition between the straight and curved track. So this virtual transition then has an implied rate of cant deficiency represented by the slope of the purple line uh, on the graph. So we're now not at a vertical straight line, we've got a slope of the line, which is this virtual transition. And this is dependent on vehicle speed, the circular curve radius, and the vehicle length that we choose to determine this over. We can now use these concepts to start mapping out what our s &C looks like from a jerk perspective at the switch toes, which is really important uh, with defining how the passenger feels when they traverse the turnout. So what we can see here is uh, three main curves, the solid lines, that represent the three different types of s &C that I talked about on the first slide. On the x-axis, we've got speed. On the y-axis, we've got rate of change of cant deficiency, or jerk, at the switch toes. So a few important points to pick out there. Um, the two dotted lines are the limits stipulated upon us by the Euronorm standard that defines track geometry. So there's a normal limit, which is the lower purple dotted line, and a exceptional limit, which is the upper blue dotted line. What I want to draw your attention to there, firstly, is uh, the H switch that Matt has been talking about at Addington Junction, which is largely aligned with the old vertical design, which is why the two dots sit on top of each other there on the bottom right. We then finally move on to the H switch for the NR60 Mark I design, which, as I said at the start, used to be 100 miles an hour, but we've now reduced to 80. And you can start to see why this decision has come into play based on how it compares with the other designs in the, in the suite that we've got. The rate of change of camp deficiency at the toe is up at 400 millimeters per second, significantly higher than anything else we've got on the, uh, on the suite. So let's look at a specific example of one of those NR60 H switches. And this is what drove all the work that I'm going to talk to you about later. One of these examples is at a place called Searchlight Lane Junction, which is on the West Coast Main Line in Staffordshire. Um, and it was installed, I think, in 2016 uh, as part of the Norton Bridge grade separation project. So Norton Bridge is a particularly, well, was a particularly challenging dunk junction in Staffordshire, uh, with trains turning off to head towards Stone and Manchester, but also trying to negotiate the line to crew. And initially, that was uh, done through the use of switch diamonds, which Matt's explained can be very unreliable. Uh, eventually, they got to the point where they decided to build a flyover, and this S&C formed part of that. The issue we had at Searchlight Lane was that shortly after it was open, we started getting reports of passengers, passenger discomfort going over the switch. So one of my colleagues, Mark Burstow, was commissioned to do a bit of a study on why this was happening. The first thing that he found was that the switch that was installed at Searchlight was installed perfectly to design. There were no variances um, with intolerance. So any of the issues we were having were likely with the design and not the specific installation at Searchlight Lane. And what he did was analyze the level of passenger discomfort that um, passengers would experience going over this particular design. And he found that the levels far exceeded anything we've got on other uh, types of S and C. So the result was that the design we've got, the H-switch design for 100 miles an hour, wasn't suitable for 100 miles an hour. And we made the decision to limit the operational speed to 80 miles an hour. So now we're in a situation where we've lost our 100 mile an hour capability. We're limited down at the 90 miles an hour uh, from the vertical and NR60 Mark II designs. In and out of straight configuration. So out of straight is when we're on straight track and we're turning out. So again, some people are going to say, we've got faster s and C. I've seen it at places like Colton Junction. And you'd be right, there's an exception and it's equal split layouts. So this is where we, instead of turning out on the straight, we equally bend both the turnout leg and the through route to increase the effective radius of the layout, which lowers that uh, cant deficiency that we see and lowers the rate of change of cant deficiency and allows us to increase the speed massively. The problem is this is only suited to specific locations. Colton Junction was one of them. The other one is at we, uh, Rugby Trent Valley Junction. 
um, but in most cases, it's not suitable. So that leaves us in a bit of a quandary. Back at this chart at the beginning, we're missing two designs that can support 100 and 125 mile hour turnouts. And that's the project that I'm looking to deliver over the next couple of years. We've already started the work on this, and that's the geometry that we've dealt. The geometry has been produced already, and it's shown on this graph that you've seen earlier. And we can see a really stark difference between what we currently ran, uh, previously ran on the H-switch at 100 miles an hour, way up at the top at 400 millimeters per second, down to a new design, which we're calling the I-switch, runs at the same speed, but is got a rate of change of current efficiency that's more comparable to existing SG designs. And then moving even faster up to the J-switch, 125 miles per hour, um, also comparable levels of rate of change of current efficiency. So we expect the passenger comfort levels on these designs to be far, far better than what we've had before. And the way we've achieved this is through larger turnout radii to reduce the cant efficiency that we see, also through the use of toe clothoid elements. This is a way of adjusting the transition at the toe to give us a lower rate of change of cant efficiency. I can illustrate that if we bring the chart back from earlier. Let's say that was our existing design with the virtual transition. By increasing the turnout radius, not only do we lower the blue line on the right, lower overall cant efficiency, we also extend and make the purple line more shallow, uh, a lower rate of change of cant efficiency, which is the important factor for uh, passenger comfort. So looking at the details of that, these are the four new designs that we produced, two for each speed, one suitable for plane leads, one suitable for crossovers. And you can see the turnout radii there uh, start at 8,000 metres and transition down to 3,000 metres. By comparison, the NR60 Mark I H switch that we've now reduced in speed just had a single turnout radii of 2,800 metres. So we've significantly increased the size of the layouts. Some of you might then ask, why are we creating new geometries? The Europeans have been developing high-speed SNC for years. It's all over the place in France and Spain and Italy. Why can't we use one of their existing designs? There's one fundamental reason that makes it difficult for to do this, and it's about track interval. So in European high-speed railways, we typically have a track interval, which is the centre-to-centre -center distance between two parallel tracks of at least 4,000 millimetres and occasionally larger than that. In the UK, we're down at 3,405 millimetres. So if you try and drop on an existing crossover design from Europe onto our uh, parallel tracks, it just won't fit. So you need to make some amendment to the design in order for it to work. So that's why we've had to develop some of these new geometries to, to support what we're looking to do. So to summarize what we will be developing, I've mentioned 100 mile an hour and 125 mile an hour turnouts and crossovers. Approval of the associated swing nose crossings, which I haven't touched on today, but they're a really important factor in being able to introduce these new layouts. Associated POE, and all delivered through a CSM safety case, as we always do with any of our significant changes on network rail. We'll be develop developing design drawings of those in-scope layouts to then share with scheme partners like HS2, TransPennine Route Upgrade, Northern Powerhouse Rail, whenever they want to look to implement junctions to network rail that require these turnout speeds. So I've mentioned that there. The first two customers of this design are planned to be at Hans Acre and Crew South. So we heard about Crew South earlier and the importance of joining uh, the end of HS2 at Phase 2A at Crew to the south of the station. But initially we'll be looking at Hans Acre Junction, which forms part of Phase 1, which is where the HS2 line will end initially before it goes on to Crew. And this will allow it to fly over much in the same way we're showing at Crew to join with the West Coast Main Line at line speed of 100 miles an hour. So finally, the question is always brought up as to why we're doing this. It's the most important question. And there's three principal reasons that I want to go through. One is to really support the requirements of HS2 in particular. Um, they're the ones that have um, pushed these requirements on us to make sure that we do have these designs available to support their project. And it will mean that they can when they build the railway, join their trains onto our infrastructure at line speed, which meets the, uh, the desirable uh, train running service that they look to achieve. Secondly, we get to reintroduce swing nose crossings to Network Rail's portfolio of products. And the important thing to understand here is, although they are a necessity for high speed turnouts, they're really, really useful for traditional turnouts as well. 
We don't just need to use them on high speed. They bring the benefits of improved resilience and reliability through the reduction of uh, a gap in the, the rail that we'd normally see in fixed crossings. We effectively get a switch at the crossing, which means we can look after that asset much more carefully going forward. The swing those crossings is really important there. And then finally, we've also heard lots today about transport for the north, and there is potential, although not confirmed yet, that they will require uh, similar turnout designs in the future that can um, deliver trains on and off their network at 100 and 125 miles an hour. So these uh, designs will support them in that. That's it for me. Thank you very much, and any questions?